five weeks. For the next five weeks, we're looking at uh, an Old Testament uh, passage. We're looking at one chapter for five weeks. Okay, two Kings chapter five. And uh, partly one of the reasons we want to do that is be able to see uh, glimpses of the gospel and quite frankly, just train our minds and our eyes and our hearts to see uh, glimpses and pointers of the gospel of redemption, even in the Old Testament. Okay, that's one of the things we're going to doing. But even, I'm saying five weeks, but we're going to have uh, a visiting speaker also one of those five weeks, but it'll go a little longer. So I'd like to just start off by saying we're looking at this 2 Kings chapter 5. We're calling it from leprosy to grace. And um, how many of us have heard that story of Naaman being cl cleansed? You, you, we all have heard. Okay, very good Christians you are. But before I start, I know some of you all say Naaman and some of you all say Naaman. Now, what have you learned? Got grown up since Naaman, Naaman. Everyone is Naaman? Too bad because I'm going to be speaking Naaman every Sunday. Just to let you know, it's the same person. Okay, so this is a story from the book of 2 Kings chapter 5. It's uh, while, while the, um, the general theme of this, of this book, uh, you know, throws light on this prophet named Elisha. 1 Kings was a lot of in, on Elijah. 2 Kings is speaking a lot of in Elisha who did something amazing. He healed a man who had a skin disease called leprosy. We're going to talk about this story and it is a story that is that's something that happened in the past. It's not just another parable. It's not a fable. It's something that actually it's a true account of something that took place many, many years ago. In fact, uh, it shows us that uh, this is another glimpse that shows us that God has always been interested in making the message of the gospel available to us even before the New Testament, okay, and um, but but what is fascinating about this book and this chapter in particular is that it shows how God bridges gaps. Okay, just remember this. It's fascinating how it shows how God bridges gaps between different kinds of people. There's a gap being bridged between slaves and owners. There's a gap being br bridged between Jews and non-Jews, between prophets and even unbelievers. And ultimately, it's all a glimpse of the big gap that was bridged between God and humanity. Okay, I'm going to just ask somebody to come and if we could read the first 17 verses of this chapter. It's, about, it, it's more than 25 verses, but we're just going to look at 17 verses. And even though we read 17 verses, we're only going to focus on the first 9 or 10. Can, would anyone like to volunteer to just come up and read the, uh, read the 17 verses in the front on the mic? Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, Naaman healed of leprosy. Now, Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in sight of his master and highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now, bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send the letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick the quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the ma man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman 
<clears throat> went with his horses and carriers and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent the messenger to, to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hands over the spots and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farfur, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in, in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of the God of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So people accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, Please let me be your servant, be given as much as earth as a pair of mules can, be, can carry. For your servant will never again make burnt offering and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. Yeah, thanks. And we'll just pray and ask the Lord to speak, be speaking to us. Dear God, we ask you, even as we look into your word, that you would um, open our hearts and our minds afresh. And I pray, Lord God, that this would be uh, something that would be your deposit in our hearts at an opportune time, a message that we need to know. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. While we did read 17 verses, I'm only going to be doing an exposition of the first few verses. Okay, And over the next few weeks, we'll be doing more. So to give you an, uh, just to give us some context about Naaman and the slave girl that we read about, Naaman was a prominent figure in this story of 2 Kings chapter 5. He was a Syrian commander general. He was in the military. He was known as a commander, very highly regarded by the king of Syria, as it says in the opening verses. But Naaman suffered from this severe skin disease called leprosy. Leprosy in those times, and in, in, I think even in some parts of the world today, but leprosy uh, in those times, in ancient times, is one of the most harshest, dreaded, contagious ailment in ancient times. It often resulted into people being isolated socially, so, and social isolation of those uh, afflicted. In contrast, the slave girl, on the other hand, was an is Israeli girl who had been taken captive during one of Syria's raids on Israel. And I'll, and I'll be explaining the geopolitical scenario also in a, in a little bit. But she ended up becoming a servant in Naaman's household. Despite her captive status, she demonstrates compassion and boldness in God by suggesting to Naaman that he should seek help from Prophet Elisha. There's this key verse in verse 2 that gives us a glimpse of what was going on uh, in Israel at that time. It says in verse 2, Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out, taken a captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. Now Israel and, I don't know if I have the map, yeah. Israel and uh, purple and the green. Israel and Aram were neighboring kingdoms. They actually often had interactions. Some of those interactions were because of trade and alliances, conflicts and warfare and all of that. But in the context of this particular biblical narrative, Israel is an independent kingdom. Aram is a separate entity. In, verse, in chapter 5, verse 2, is describing an instance where Aramean raiders, that is from the green area, they crossed into the boundaries of Israel's territory 
and they took this young girl captive it's very important to know that this is not an indication that israel was under aram's rule no they were not they were a they were two separate entities israel was not colonized the property people and uh, you know uh, projects of israel were not uh, naturally automatically belonging to aram no it was it is not an indication that israel was under aram's rule now throughout the old testament you'll find various accounts of interactions between aram and israel and more in particular the northern israel what we see in purple there were sometimes friendly interactions and there were sometimes hostile interactions because they were neighboring kingdoms but they still always remained as two distinct political entities they had their own rulers they had their own territories yeah the presence of this young israeli girl in neiman's household represents a form of there was a exchange of culture between two nations she would have brought with her customs her language her religious beliefs of israel and her presence in the household of neiman the commander general of the, of the military in iran would have played a very pivotal role in the story because ultimately she suggests to neiman to seek help from elisha it spoke something of her upbringing her cultural background do you agree but not just that it it also is evident of a social hierarchy the fact that neiman's wife the fact that she served neiman's wife indicates there was a hierarchy of that time so so when so when the slave girl goes there she she occupies a subordinate position in this household but there's something very interesting about neiman Naaman was a military leader and not just any military leader he was a leader at a time when Damascus was the capital of Syria he served the king by the name of king Ben Hadad he had actually earned a great reputation because by him being a commander in chief by him being the commander of the military victories and battles made him highly regarded even by the king himself that's actually how verse 1 starts of saying right it says that because by him the lord had given victory to israel he was a mighty man and he was in high favor but despite military success he had one significant problem he had leprosy and it's a severe skin disease unfortunately we that's all the information we have about naaman We don't know about his background. We don't know what was his family like. We don't know what were his life experiences before becoming a military commander. But what we do know is, he was an exceptional military strategist. He led Syria to numerous victories over its enemies, including the northern uh, kingdom of Israel, what I just showed you in the map earlier. What is but what is so puzzling to the to the reader of scripture today? Is 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 actually when you read uh, verse one, it says it appears that God, and this is not God of Aram, it is the God of Israel, the Yahweh God, the God that. It's interestingly, it says it appears that God was helping Naaman succeed in his military career. Is that there in your Bible? Do you think that's? that's a puzzle i mean you can't just i mean of course you can just read and and continue reading got to stop there hey wait a minute what's happened here and this may seem puzzling it may seem like god is aiding and helping a nation like syria aram which is also called syria which didn't worship the god of israel and in fact at that moment while we are reading this and in that moment of history it's an enemy of israel the enemy of israel now god's ways are mysterious before this incident there are in in the past in the old testament we see of similar situation that is uh, in you know arose in fact i'm not going to go into the details but there was a time when israel when they initially entered the promised land god did not drive out the canaanites because israel had disobeyed they used them god used the canaanites as a test okay at another point when god appointed the babylon babylonians to actually conquest jerusalem 
and all these Canaanites and all the Babylonians, all of these are enemies of Israel. And God, the scriptures read, uh, we, we read scripture shows of how God used all of these enemies. God used them. Now, in these historical examples, like the Canaanites, the Babylonians, and even Naaman, they probably didn't recognize that God of Israel was the one behind their success. And that begs us to ask another question as we, as we go through you know, the verses of 2 Kings chapter 5. What was Naaman's relationship with God? What was Naaman's relationship with the God of Israel? Naaman, like all other people, had a connection with the Lord, even though he did not realize it. Although he was a mighty leader in the Syrian army, he served under King Ben-Hadad. He was not a worshipper of the God of Israel. But instead, if you read 2 Kings chapter 5, he worshipped another God called Rimon. He had no knowledge of the God of Israel, even though the God of Israel knew him and was actually granting him success in his military career. Okay? In fact, in one of the battles, which is, which is spoken of properly in 1, chapter, one Kings, okay? in one of the battles when Israel was facing Syria, king, that, that time the king of Israel was King Ahab, he was killed by a seemingly random arrow, an event that was not, the king was killed, but that was not because the enemy had orchestrated it. The king of Israel was killed because God had orchestrated it. It's there in one kings. And I think, as I was preparing, it's possible that Naaman had heard of this victory. It's even possible he would have fought in this battle, but he did not understand how did God, how did God do that? He would have had misconceptions of the God of Israel because in his mind, the way people related to God was they had many local gods, specialist gods, right? He would have related to the God of Israel as one among the many local gods. In a previous battle, when Israel won in the mountains, the Syrians had concluded that Israel's God was a mountain God in 1 Kings chapter 20. All of this is 1 Kings, the previous book, we are in 2 Kings. In a previous battle, so when Israel won on the mountain, the Syrians actually concluded that the God of Israel is the mountain God. So the next time they planned to fight the Israelites, they chose not to fight on the mountain, they, fight, they fought on the plains, thinking their gods would give them an advantage if we fight on the mountains. So there's something that Naaman knows about the God of Israel. So during that time, people believed that gods were limited to regions and situations. You could choose a god based on your needs. You could manipulate them. You could even avoid them. Naaman perhaps held this similar view. He believed that he could work around the god of Israel. If that's a god of the mountains, we'll fight them on the plains. If that's a god of the west, we'll fight them on the east. You know, and so Naaman probably Naaman probably had that view. But he didn't, he he did have a glimpse, but he didn't truly understand the nature of Israel's God. Israel's God, the Yahweh God, was not confined just to the mountains of the plains. He was everywhere. He was, in fact, this God was shaping Naaman's successes and failures. And Naaman knew nothing about it. Naaman's journey reveals the depth of God's involvement in his life and God's desire to bring in a healing, God's desire to bring in salvation, even though Naaman knew nothing about it. He had no knowledge of the Lord, even though the Lord knew him, granted him success in battle. That leads us to the next segment of the talk. Naaman's troubles. Friends, Naaman's journey towards salvation was not something that he paved on his own. He did not choose to contract leprosy. Naaman did not choose to contract leprosy. It came unexpectedly. The person who put him on the path towards healing was his own slave girl. 
it wasn't something that Naaman initiated. It wasn't something that Naaman wanted. It was circumstances beyond Naaman's control that made him look for help. Now at this point of the story, we see that Naaman is now beginning to learn an important lesson. He's learning a lesson on his own limitations. He's learning a lesson on his own vulnerability. He's experiencing fear, uncertainty about his condition. He does not know the full extent of what his future lies ahead. He's been a successful, highly successful general in the Syrian army, in the Syrian military. But now he's faced with a situation he could not control, he could not reverse. Leprosy was a devastating disease for Naaman. It actually wasn't just a health issue for Naaman. It is a health issue. But it's, for Naaman, it was more than just a health issue. It was a life-altering, crumbling, weakening condition. In his time, leprosy led to social isolation and separation from society and loved ones. In Leviticus, we read about how lepers were often quarantined. And they had to actually cry out, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, just to warn others of their presence. That was the status of lepers. And we read about it very closely in Leviticus 13. You can go back home and read. For Naaman, however, this meant that he was aware that eventually, eventually, regardless of all the success of his military commander general career that he has, regardless of his military careers and prospects, subconsciously he is aware that eventually he's going to be cut off with everyone except fellow lepers. You need to realize the stigma associated with leprosy was one of the harshest in ancient times. It's a severe blow to his social status. It's a severe blow to his military career. And as a military leader, he needs to be in close contact with his troops. But being a leper, he couldn't put his soldiers at risk, right? Now, Naaman had, uh, I've written over there, he's been a successful general, but he's contacted something that he can't control, he can't reverse. In verse 2, I think, is it? Um, yeah, in verse 1, it says, it's the Bible simply states, he, but he had leprosy. It emphasizes how powerless he was, how powerless he felt, knowing that his health is just deteriorating, it's crumbling slowly, it's just going to go away for him. he's going to ebb away. In this dire situation, Naaman is forced to confront the reality he could not fix this problem on his own. He could not fix this problem on his own. His life has turned upside down. He needs help desperately. The question is, where could he turn for that help? Now this, my friends, is the turning point in Naaman's story. It actually begins, not instantly with this miracle of healing, it actually begins with a journey of discovery. He's discovering at least two things. He's going to embark on a journey of discovery and he's going to embark on a journey of discovering at least two things. He's going to discover that he's a man with limitations. He's a man with weakness. It's counterintuitive to everything that his society and his country has told him till now. Because until now, he was strong, successful, pursuing and sailing and almost nailing his military career. And now he's discovering he has limitations and he's weak. The second thing he begins, he will begin to start discovering is that the God of Israel is a God of power, but also a God of grace as the verses unfold. I'd like to take the spotlight off Naaman for like just a few minutes and put the spotlight towards us, right? Think of our troubles. I'm sure most of us are not coming uh, too close with leprosy, but just think of our troubles and the thing of uh, the fact, have you experienced a time 
when truly something devastating happened when you felt utterly powerless a situation when you've come head on head with the fact that you can't fix this on your own and you've also come to realize that actually no one else can even fix this i can't fix this on my own and i've also come to realize that no one else can either and i know of situations and places and spaces and people and experiences and of people and friends over here in this room who we have friends and family offering support offering encouragement offering prayers but deep down you know that no human has the power to solve your problem you've been there of course community prays and encourages you loves you does all of this we have fun together but you know deep down no human no human has the power to solve your problem it's a feeling of helplessness and as fear re- you know, you know realize you find yourself in something what looks like a dark tunnel there's no visible way out in other words you hit rock bottom and we know stories in the bible think of job job in fact says he is a very inspiring person but when he was going through his troubles he made a he makes a comment in chapter 3 he says what i feared has come upon me and he's speaking of, he's speaking this in despair he's speaking this in despair and job is saying in chapter 3 when i what i feared has actually come upon me what i dreaded has happened to me i have no peace i have no rest i have no quietness i only have turmoil he's he's the context is he's speaking from a place of anguish and hopelessness for neiman leprosy is a severe skin disease that's not the same as sin but in the bible it often symbolizes an incurable condition leprosy leads to isolation loneliness and physical uh, deterioration in fact leprosy was a picture it was a powerful picture of how destructive sin is it's a picture it's a glimpse of how destructive the grip of sin has on our lives and in fact isaiah describes our condition when we try to heal ourselves spiritually without god's intervention isaiah speaks i think it's in chapter 1 we won't go there but he speaks of how when we are spiritually sick there is no cure except through god's healing and just like naaman we are spiritually dead without god awakening us you realize that you're spiritually dead without god awakening us awakening us friends the truth is god loved naaman and in 2 kings chapter 5 we find god we find god not naaman we find god widely awake to the reality of how desperate naaman's condition is leprosy is a problem that naaman could not solve on his own and yet it now became a turning point in his life you know we focus so much on the miracle of the him being freed from leprosy which is something to focus on that is something to celebrate the miracle is something that we need to look for but but isn't it amazing to see that that turning point leads Naaman on a journey of discovery. He discovered I'm weak. He discovers God is not weak, and not just in this place in Scripture, but in several places in Scripture, we are convinced theologically, in God's economy, rock bottom is not always a bad place to be. If there's one thing you remember from today. remember this in god's economy hitting rock bottom isn't always a bad place to be in fact hitting rock bottom could could be the starting point for something divine to happen it could be the starting point 
for us to get on our journey of discovery. Naaman's story teaches us that. It teaches us that when we recognize how powerless we are, how limited we are, how weak we are as humans, and when we turn to God for help, even from unexpected sources like the slave girl, we actually open ourselves to the possibility of us being transformed spiritually. Right? As I begin to just wind up and wrap up the thoughts uh, for this for, for part one of Leprosy to Grace, I'd like to show us how Naaman's story can remind us of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Think of not leprosy, but spiritual leprosy, sin. Naaman's physical leprosy can be seen uh, as a picture of spiritual leprosy that actually affects all humanity. Just as leprosy was a devastating and incurable disease, sin separates us from God. It ultimately leads us to spiritual death. And in the same way that Naaman was helpless to cure himself, the gospel reminds us we are unable to free ourselves from the bondage of sin. I don't, I don't mean to say that the, that the intended meaning of the author when he wrote the verses of chapter 5 uh, was intended to just uh, uh, mean the gospel. I'm just saying it points to, it, it reminds us of the gospel. You can't read it and not think of the gospel is what I'm trying to say. Think of the fact that there's a need of a savior. Naaman's desperate search for healing, in fact, mirrors the humanity's need for a savior. Just as Naaman turns to Elisha for a cure, you and I turn to Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is the ultimate healer. Think of the humility of faith. And this is what something really touched me. Naaman had to humble himself being the commander, being that commander post, okay? He had to humble himself not to somebody of his own country, but to the country of, to an enemy country. He had to humble himself, follow the prophet Elisha's instructions to dip himself in the Jordan River, which he knew that there were better rivers. He had to do all of that to be cleansed. And he had to do that seven times to be cleansed of leprosy. Think of the gospel. The gospel calls you and me to humble ourselves in faith. It's not about our merits, but it's about trusting in the finished work of Christ on the cross, cleansing through water. In Romans, it speaks about the act of washing in the Jordan River symbolized Cleansing and purification. Baptism, water baptism for us Christians is a central element in our Christian faith. It involves water. It symbolizes washing away of sin and identification with Christ and his resurrection. Grace and unmerited favor. Naaman received his healing as a gift of grace from God. Salvation is by God's grace alone. And the role of a mediator Elisha served as a mediator between Naaman and the God of Israel. So Elisha had instructed him on what he needed to do for the healing in the gospel. In fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says, Jesus is our mediator who bridges the gap between sinful humanity and a holy God. The, the reason I'm trying to say why we need to see, why we need to read Naaman's story through the lens of the gospel is because Ultimately, we know that Naaman did not earn his healing. He received it as a gift of grace. He did not earn his healing. He couldn't earn his healing. He didn't have capacity to buy healing. The only way he could get healing is if he received it as a gift of grace from God. That's the same with salvation. That's the same with salvation. We can't buy our redemption through self-righteousness. It's a gift of it's a gift of grace from God. And as I close, I'd like to remind us the things that I always try to remind us as I close. 
Why did Jesus die? In Matthew 8, it says, When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill, and, 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 and Matthew writes, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Now, what it do, now what does it say in Isaiah? Surely he took up our pain, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgression, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Isaiah is prophetically describing the suffering and the sacrificial work of Jesus the Messiah on the cross, that he had to bear the sins and pain of humanity, which would ultimately lead to peace through his suffering and death. Friends, the Isaiah passage, and which Matthew is, Matthew is speaking of and pointing to, is referring to Christ and his redemptive work on the cross. All the suffering we experience today, including disease, is temporary. We eagerly await a time where physical pain will no longer exist. God's ultimate purpose is actually to set creation free from decay and bring glory to his children. Jesus, during his earthly ministry, gave us a glimpse of this future by healing many people. And ultimately, he defeats death and disease by taking upon himself, by taking them upon himself and suffering for our sins on the cross. My closing lines for today. One day, all diseases will be eradicated in God's redeemed creation. That day, we will enjoy a new earth, new body, and everlasting life. We will be singing songs of thanks to the Lamb who redeemed us from sin, death, and disease. And until that day, may we live our lives joyfully bound to the gospel. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this time. And we want to thank you for this moment of just being able to reflect on, on, on scripture and seeing that you are not only a God of power, but you are also a God of grace. Deeply interested in the lives of people, even when they don't know about it. And you are also deeply interested in the lives of those sitting here this morning. And I pray, Lord God, in some way, in some mysterious way, for those of us struggling to respond to you, would you illuminate our minds and our hearts to respond to you in boldness, courage, humility, and faith. May our lives never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen.